I think the, the main things that I like to emphasize, uh, you know, in the first few slides, really about how palliative care has changed and how supportive care has changed uh, even since I was a resident. So I did my residency between 2003 and 2006. And just to see the, the types of situations where palliative care would be introduced or even brought up um, is markedly, markedly different than it was. And part of this is really a focus on if we think about how society has changed, when we think about aging Americans, by the year 2030, we know that at least one in five Americans is gonna be at least 65 years old. And it's not that I any, have any uh, uh, sense of ageism or concerns about older Americans, but we know that patients are living to be older, and as they're living to be older, they're dealing with more and more advanced illnesses and dying across the care spectrum. And part of this is because Previously, life-limiting illnesses or life-threatening illnesses like cancer or HIV or advanced heart failure, which would potentially be, again, w with limited treatment options, could port portend a very short survival. But now as we have better treatments and, and we see mortality going down, patients have become increasingly complex. And I think of this as when I was an internal medicine resident about 12 years ago, it wouldn't be uncommon in the community medicine forum uh, to accept a patient with cellulitis or to accept someone with hyperglycemia who needed some adjustment to their insulin or to accept a patient who had a COPD exacerbation. And I think ra rarely the patients are that simple at this point because those issues tend to be taken care of in the outpatient setting. And what we see is that patients have a multiple uh, host of, of complex illness. So they might survive their cancer uh, but have side effects of the treatment of the cancer. They might survive their myocardial infarction, but now have chronic heart failure and chronic kidney disease. And really this has changed the landscape, and I think we all could agree uh, that a lot of the patients are, are much more complex overall in terms of what we have to document and what we have to monitor and, and what our responsibilities are in this situation. So when we think about how death has changed, as one of my colleagues, uh, Tim Moynihan, used to say, uh, death is, is you know, 100% prevalent and incident. So we know that uh, death hasn't necessarily changed. We all die, but how we die certainly has changed. And when we think back to the change of the, between the, the 1800s and the 1900s, when death pretty much happened at home or on the farm, we know as all the medical changes that occurred throughout the 1900s, the 20th century, we really saw the medicalization of death, where death was really moved into the hospital. And the support study, which happened, which the results were reported in 1995, really showed that even though patients were dying in the hospital, and we as clinicians were trying our best to stave off death, sometimes stave off the inevitable, and try to fix things that sometimes just can't be fixed, that patients weren't necessarily more satisfied with their care, that there were pain and other symptoms that were untreated, that hospitalizations sometimes were lengthy and the interventions that were undertaken were quite invasive and didn't lead to increased satisfaction. And this wasn't only for the patients, but this was for the families as well. So when we think about what we can do in particular situations, what's possible and how we could you know, best treat our patients and meet them where they're at, it's important to think about how aggressive should we be in given situations. And one fact that I find very interesting is that 98% of Medicare decedents uh, spend at least some time in the hospital in the last year of their life. And, and I think that's not too surprising. We know that sometimes hospitalizations occur but really the, the intensification of care and how we help people to make decisions about very uh, aggressive care or interventions sometimes is challenging and there's at least uh, some studies that quote between 15 and over half of patients that are Medicare decedents have at least one ICU admission in the last six months of their life. So it's important to think I'm not an oncologist, I'm an internist by training and a palliative care clinician by training. And I rotate on the medicine wards and, and you know, try to think of myself as a, as a fairly good internist. So it's really important to understand that I have nothing against patients going to the ICU. I mean, I, I can use the examples of saying that I had patients with stage four gastric cancer that came in hypotensive and I said, yes, they need to go to the intensive care unit. And in that situation, 
kind of got that look and they were like, wait, you're the palliative care guy and you're sending this person to the ICU? And I said, absolutely, this is urosepsis, this is treatable, a time under the trial of aggressive fluid resuscitation and parenteral antibiotics is absolutely indicated for this patient. It doesn't mean that if his heart stops or if he stops breathing that we're going to resuscitate him with CPR, but he absolutely deserves the opportunity to be in the ICU in this situation. And that might be very, very different from the person who continues to come back to the ICU with multiple complications. And really the question is, what, what's, what's going on? What are our endpoints here? And what do we really understand about the complications of the underlying uh, disease processes here? So as uh, Dr. Butler mentioned, I'm interested in, in bioethics and, and I like to think of myself as someone who's interested in bioethics where the rubber meets the road. I'm not going to be overly philosophical on how I approach things, but I do recognize that there are a lot of times there's things that we can do, but what should we do in a given situation? How do we identify and resolve really challenging moral problems of, of what, what we have out there, what may give the person hope, uh, what might take away hope if we don't give them, how hope is a dynamic concept over time, and how do people really understand what's curative or not curative? So, what, what we can do doesn't necessarily always equal what we should do in a given situation. And this is just an example of the four principles, which are, again, basic way of looking at um, what are our obligations to patients and society and healthcare. And in the middle of this bullseye, we look at beneficence. And I would say, you know, I agree with Edmund Pellegrino, who was a, a virtue ethicist that said, really, beneficence is the central aim of medicine. So when we look at that bullseye, why did we go into medicine? You could be in going to nursing school, physician school, uh, nurse practitioner, PA, social work. It really doesn't matter. Usually it's I want to help people. I want to do good for patients. I want to give back to society. I want to help others. I want to act out in some sort of service. So it makes a lot of sense to me. That resonates with me that beneficence is the central end of medicine. We want to do good for our patients. But sometimes there's a very fine line between what it means to do good and what it means to potentially harm someone. And we think about the second principle of Beecham and Childress, which is non-maleficence. How do we not hurt people? How do we help them to make the best decisions that they can with the, with the information that we have and try to balance helping people versus hurting people? And that, answering that question usually isn't the one that gets you into medical school or nursing school, saying, I want to go into medicine because I don't want to hurt people. You know, that's usually not the, the, the real reason that's going to get you in. It might get you a little bit of a funny look. Beneficence, I think, still remains the central aim, and sometimes a corollary of that is non-maleficence. How do we do good for patients by potentially not harming them? And that really all gets couched in the third ring, which is respect for patient autonomy. And this has really become an issue because when we think back 50 years and when we think about the paternalism of medicine where clinicians know best and clinicians make decisions and clinicians could hold, uh, withhold information and consent from patients in, in certain situations, we think about that was, was done out of the, the guise of paternal, out of the guise of beneficence, but patients said, I want to be able to have a part in my own decision making. I want to have a part and what's done to my body and, and what decisions that I have. And what we saw, particularly in the past 25 to 30 years, is a real swing towards, well, the patient wants this, so we have to do it. And you know, we think about this for you know, particular situations and, and, and patients' rights groups that may say, you know, gosh, there's drug A uh, that may be indicated for, for treatment of, of cancer A, and in a given situation, that someone might want to apply that to another treatment, and you know the studies just don't bear that out. But the patients say, you know, I'm entitled to that drug. This has helped so many people, and I really want this, and it's about what I want. And I deserve a fourth line of chemotherapy. And you could tell me that it hurts or is going to be risky, but, but it's my body, and it's my right to have done to my body what I want. That's very different than Marcus Welby not even really telling you that you have cancer or that you have options for cancer and just kind of moving on and, and engaging in, in a mere 
a discussion about um, how do we help you to feel better. Very, very different. So when people come in with their reams of paper uh, from Google or UpToDate or WebMD or MayoClinic.com, uh, which I still think, uh, you know, I did graduate from there, but I think the information on that particular site tends to be fairly balanced, but there's a lot of places that uh, the information isn't balanced about what treatments are potential. And then when we think about that with injustice, we'll often hear how are we using our resources wisely to help as many people as we can? How are we helping children to be vaccinated? How are we helping people to get preventative health services when we're putting ventricular assist devices in patients with uh, advanced heart failure? When we're putting $10,000 biologics uh, into patients frequently with very, very small likelihoods of, of return on investment. So I'll we'll hear a lot of these, these uh, particular situations, and I'll often ask my, my residents when they're there, you know, which of these is most important? And look at me and they might say, well, you know, for me it's beneficence and, you know, for the patients maybe it's autonomy. And what I really like to say is that Beecham & Childress made it very clear that no principle takes import over another principle, and that really it's our jobs as clinicians to really go through a process of specification, to think about how does this decision, how does this option potentially contribute to beneficence or avoid non-maleficence or allow the patient to have autonomy in a given situation. And it's not only do we know which one's you know, most important, it's often a situation where we, we don't know. They're all important, or there's, there's facets of all of them that are important. And it's our job to really try to figure that out in a process of shared decision making. Now, interestingly, that justice argument is often invoked. And what we have to remember is that the issue related to justice really tends to be a societal level decision, not a bedside level decision. So we can argue that in this particular situation, putting them on a ventilator and doing dialysis isn't good use of our resources because we could be using those resources on other healthcare services. But the way healthcare is in the United States, it doesn't allow for the redistribution of goods and services that way. If we don't do dialysis on patient Mr. Jones because it doesn't seem like it's medically indicated, that doesn't mean that we get to save X amount of dollars and we get to reappropriate those funds into preventative health services. Some insurance company pays less of an already low reimbursement or the hospital loses less money off of their DRG uh, than they're already getting when they're giving more services than they're going to get paid for. But that doesn't translate into reallocations of goods and services. So justice is something we have to be careful with. It's really a society level thing. It's not something that we can broadly apply to patients at the bedside. And really the only situation we could do that is really in the situation of a mass casualty where we have you know, X amount of ventilators and we have to think which patients are going to benefit from this particular treatment. And really unless we're in the situation and, and being in the Gulf, I'm, I'm ever mindful of, of the situations that clinicians face during Hurricane Katrina about which patients can benefit from a ventilator in a given situation. And we all think about those particular cases but, uh, as being rare, but they certainly can come to light in, in certain situations. So how do we apply those principles and help people to make the best decisions that they can? And I'd like to use an example of a 79-year-old Caucasian uh, gentleman. He's a retired farmer. He's living in Gadsden, a uh, town I picked in northeast Alabama. He's with his wife of 60 years. And because we all use the electronic medical record, we have to use very clever acronyms that make our keystrokes as minimal as possible. So we could basically say that, you know, these uh, past uh, medical issues with diabetes and heart disease and COPD and OSA and peripheral arterial disease and prostate cancer and renal disease and, and multiple myeloma now, um, though it looks potentially like something that, gosh, that, that's really a, a hyperbole there, sweats. So um, I think most of us can relate to patients being like this and having very, very complex medical issues and having multiple issues um, and, and facing very, very tough decisions about which medicines to take and which ones can, can be beneficial and which ones can hurt or, or help. 
And in this particular patient, he had some chronic kidney disease over time, but now with the myeloma, we're starting to see worsening kidney function. And the concept of hemodialysis is brought up, that this particular patient should start hemodialysis. So when we think about that, and when we think about autonomy and the patient's you know, right to say, yes, start me on dialysis, or no, I don't want to start on dialysis. And when we think about the factors that might impact that, um, I have bright lights, so I'm not going to be able to see you and identify you as answering this, but just throw out something, and I'll repeat it for the microphone, something that you think is important in terms of medical decision making for this patient considering dialysis. What factors are important? And it's not the beta-2 microglobulin or anything like that, I assure you, or if it's IG, IgG or IgM cap or a lambda, I assure you of that. Functional status, how functional is the person? What's his quality of life? Does he have good quality of life? Is this going to improve his quality of life? What was that again? Yeah, is he, is he cognitively intact? Does he have underlying dementia? Um, is this something that uh, he really understands what he's getting into. How about one more? How's he going to get there? How is he going to get there? Because, you know, I, I'm learning, you know, Minnesota's a big state, and there's Minneapolis and Rochester and huge, vast land of, of, uh, of Minnesota, and I'm learning a lot about Alabama, too, in terms of, gosh, sometimes it's really hard when you have to go to dialysis and it's 20 miles away and you don't have transportation that's covered, and your son might be able to take you, but it's kind of unreliable, and you're still on the farm and you want to remain active on the farm, and the son has taken over the farm, and it's your, your livelihood if he has to get away from the farm to drive you there. And then you could think about what about religious or spiritual or cultural preferences that say, you know, one person that says, I, I'm okay, I'm at peace with God, whatever happens, and another person who says it's an act of suicide to not do everything you can to live as long as you can. And we know that both of those are, are kind of extreme situations, but I think those are all things that sometimes we hear. So how easy is it to get the treatment? What are the complications? How well is someone tolerating it? How are they going to get there? Um, you know, what, what's the financial burdens of, of this particular situation? There's lots that goes into it. It's not just a matter of, of how technically capable the interventional radiologist is at putting in a split catheter and how technically capable a nephrologist is in beginning to run the dialysis machine, but what are the factors that go into this are much more complicated. So we could talk about palliative care, we could talk about supportive care, and, and I like to think of palliative care in this particular situation as how do we actively care for patients the whole patient, the total patient, in a way that helps to manage their symptoms and helps them to live the best they can as long as they can in a situation where cure may not be possible. So how do we help patients and families to achieve the best quality of life, but also how do we normalize the process of dying and recognize that, unfortunately, again, the, the mortality rate is still 100%. And there sometimes are things we can do to delay uh, or, or uh, prolong survival, but sometimes there's limitations to what we can do. So how can we affirm life and help people to make choices that really help them to meet their goals and recognize that our goal is to not hasten the dying process, but also that our, our technology and our abilities to limit or postpone death is, is sometimes very, very finite. We can't necessarily postpone death inevit inevitably. So we think about this in terms of palliative care is very similar to how we provide comprehensive cancer care. It really takes a team. It takes a village, and sometimes the physician is an important part of that team in terms of uh, driving the assessment or overall plan of care, but sometimes it's members that are nurses or social workers or spiritual ministers or, or psychologists or counselors or, or multiple other folks that are really able to meet the patient and where their needs are at and sometimes get much, much more definitive information than I might be able to get uh, in a very limited intervention. And focusing on comfort and quality of life are very, very important. And what's very, very important, I think, is this concept of when we think about palliative care or supportive care, 
we're really thinking about not excluding therapies. We're not talking about if you see Dr. Sweats, you're going to have to stop your chemotherapy. Or if you see Dr. Sweats, he's going to get you off dialysis because you can't see him if you're doing dialysis. We're really thinking about therapies aren't excluded, but how does that therapy help the person to meet their goals of care? And understanding that a person's goals of care changes over time. What I hoped for when I was 28 is very different than what I hoped for when I was 38, is very different than what I hoped for than when I was 18. I recently had a, a, a disc issue and had surgery. What I hoped for before surgery and coming out of that is very different than what I hoped for after. So it doesn't necessarily have to be you know, this huge drawn out process, but we do have to understand that saying this person's a fighter might put us in a situation where that person might be put into a situation where there's not necessarily a winning situation. So we're asking someone to fight for something and when we fight we set up winners and losers. And sometimes that's not what we need to do. Sometimes we need to understand that what I hoped for at one moment may be very different than what I hoped for. Prolonging survival may be one thing that I'm going for versus later there being a greater focus on how do I have better quality of life? How do I maximize my quality of life? How do I have meaningful interactions and closures with those that I love? So for me, the sphere of palliative care is very, very comprehensive and can be thought of uh, throughout the disease trajectory. And for me, hospice is something that I do, but it's a fraction of what I do. Hospice is a very specific type of palliative care when patients have very specific life-limiting prognosis where if the disease runs its normal course, I wouldn't be surprised that this person died in six months or less. And because the funding of hospice is often modeled after Medicare, often that has to do with how do we use our resources that are being appropriated to focus on comfort or quality of life or to focus on life-prolonging therapies. And that particular situation is becoming ever more complicated when we think about not only treatments related to the specific diagnosis, but now when we're looking at reimbursement for hospice, looking at uh, how is this leading to the person's prognosis? How is this particular treatment leading to prognosis? So if a person is on a treatment for uh, a renal failure, for, such as dialysis, really doesn't matter so much that we're potentially considering hospice for something unrelated to that renal dialysis. So that's something that we're going to have to be very aware of and it's certainly a moving target. This is very different than the very small fraction of patients that are receiving palliative care at the very, very end of their life. They might be receiving it without going on hospice because they had a catastrophic issue. And when we're thinking about comfort care only, we're thinking about treatments that are focusing purely on a person's comfort. So this is a situation where the gentleman I did a consult on um, came in for a GI bleed, was very, very functional, but had a PEA arrest and an anoxic brain injury, had a very poor uh, likelihood of outcome. And in that particular situation, focusing on a comfort-directed strategy, really focused on how do we make sure there's not dyspnea and fever and, and uh, how do we manage any myoclonus or seizure activity in that particular situation. That may be very, very different than a patient with class four uh, stage D heart failure who's opting for a palliative care type of strategy. But if we conflate comfort care with palliative care, we may actually be doing more harm. So for these particular patients with advanced heart failure, continuing diuretics, continuing ACE inhibitors if they're tolerated, continuing low dose beta blocker if they're tolerated, aren't only drugs that we're keeping just to keep them, but to stop them may actually make the patient feel worse. If the person's still making urine, and if the person is asymptomatic with their blood pressure of 85 over 60, and we know that keeping them on their beta blocker is going to keep their heart rate down and minimize the risk of ischemia and, and uh, unstable angina, then I need to try to keep that medication on board. If the person's still making urine and I stop their, their diuretic and only use morphine, in that particular situation, I might be making the patient feel worse and I might be making them have worsening side effects. I might make their dyspnea work worse because they're volume overloaded 
And as their kidneys fail, I might be making their overall mentation and, and neurologic status worse by using morphine. And we'll certainly talk about toxicity of, of uh, <coughs> symptom treatments tomorrow. So I was just at the American Academy of Hospice and Palliative Medicine meeting, and, and uh, Joan Lunny received one of the uh, Lifetime Achievement Awards. And uh, she and Lynn and Hogan uh, published this uh, study that looked at uh, what are some of the trajectories that patients over, who, who die, who are on Medicare, what are some of the trajectories that they experience? And we can think about patients in the upper left, very high functioning, and like that patient had a GI bleed that was massive, PEA arrest, and now anoxic brain injury, and really we're, we're looking at a very sudden death, sudden decline in functional status and death. We could think about patients who begin to develop a terminal illness such as cancer, maybe pancreatic cancer where they were doing well, and now as they develop complications of the cancer and its treatment and have overall progression of disease, we see decreasing functional status that tends to be fairly on a, uh, a uh, precipitous and ongoing decline. In the bottom left, we can think about organ failure and really we could think about patients who have heart failure or advanced uh, uh, COPD, uh, where again, ongoing exacerbations, the person has an exacerbation, they're hospitalized, they don't quite get back to the functional status they had before. And then they're re-hospitalized again, they have a decline in functional status, they don't quite get back to where they were before. And this is different than the frailty situation where we think about patients with multimorbidity, multiple medical problems, underlying cognitive impairment, where the underlying functional status is low and we see this really stuttering course uh, of just the dwindles. We just see patients overall uh, on this decline. And what I find fascinating about this is when they looked at uh, hundreds of patients uh, in, in the Medicare database, that 92% of patients, uh, Medicare decedents, fit into one of these profiles. And what I can tell you, if, uh, you know, based on my experience, that a lot of patients tend to, to see themselves in what, which quadrant? Where do you think most patients see themselves uh, when they're coming to you, whether they're in oncology clinic or whether they're you know, coming for a regular medical exam or when they're making decisions about their mom? Where do you think they see that person? Most people would say the upper left, right? So I could think about a patient who was on dialysis and you know, we're talking about the person's inability to tolerate dialysis. We could think about the person's uh, worsening mentation and ongoing hypotension. And we talked about the son's goals of care, and his answer was, I just pray every night that mom doesn't wake up. I just pray that mom doesn't wake up and that I don't have to make a decision because mom's gonna have a sudden death. But interestingly, we have people who have advanced dementia, have uh, uh, the stuttering multiple uh, courses of hospitalization for heart failure. And what they found is 7% of Medicare decedents fit into that upper left-hand corner, that they'll just die in their sleep suddenly, or they'll have a very quick event that takes their life very quickly. And interestingly, we find that patients who are on dialysis actually behave more like the terminal illness trajectory. So they are usually can teeter along okay as long as their cognitive status is good, their nutritional status is good, their psychosocial support is good in terms of getting rides there and they're tolerating the treatment, and then something happens where they start having a decline. Maybe it's uh, a, a myocardial infarction and now they don't have uh, blood pressure to tolerate it. Maybe it's uh, a bad pneumonia and ARDS and they have a prolonged hospitalization. Maybe it's, it's uh, just something with a stroke or cognition and, and we start seeing that decline. But really what they found is that 47% of people fall into this frailty category, yet when we're talking about this and patients or families are waiting for this big precipitous change to occur, sometimes it really requires us as clinicians to step back and not look at this hospitalization where, yes, the patient came in, they have an aspiration pneumonia, we treated it, they go back to the nursing home. And then not look at that one and only look at when they come back 27 days later with another aspiration pneumonia and say, this person's here with aspiration pneumonia, they need antibiotics, and maybe, you know, the scariest thought is, maybe someone's even gonna say, maybe they should get a PEG tube now. 
which is really what causes you know, myocardial ischemia for me uh, because that's not the kind of group that we want to be helping with PEG tubes and there's actually great evidence that shows that PEG tubes are harmful in that situation. So it's really about not looking at this hospitalization or this hospitalization or this hospitalization. It's about taking a step back and saying, where is the trajectory? And when we do that, often we'll see, gosh, dad was doing great two years ago. And then mom died and he went into the home and he was in assisted living. And then he had that pneumonia really bad. And when he had the pneumonia, he got that heart attack. And then it just seems like he keeps coming back to the hospital and he's not getting stronger. But and dad is a fighter. And you think back where dad was two years ago is different than where dad was a year and a half ago, different where dad was a year ago, different where dad was even during his last hospitalization. Okay. And I think one of the real challenges is that when we think about um, the, the organ failure, this is a, a, a particular from Larry Allen's uh, uh, position paper for advanced heart failure, you know, we could think about situations where we see this stuttering decline and sometimes we're stuck in situations where we have treatments that we can offer or we have very, very aggressive treatments that, that might have potential uh, high burdens but potentially could have you know, high benefits. And how do we help people to make these decisions? Because a lot of the, the models of palliative care that exist that we think of as, gosh, we're gonna do a lot in terms of cure or, or disease targeted therapy and then there's gonna be this linear decline in terms of we're gonna have less clinical effort that we could focus on curative or disease targeted therapy, and we're gonna have more efforts that we focus on palliation. And sometimes it's not as linear as we think. There are, are specific events, and that could be, you know, gosh, for, for patients with heart failure, the first time their defibrillator goes off. You know, that's a big event. That's not just a linear, that's a big drop off in terms of you know, what that puts them at risk for the future. When we think about our patients with certain types of cancer, when they have recurrent disease, when they had controlled disease and surgical intervention, and now they have recurrent metastatic disease, you know, when they've progressed through treatment line A or treatment line B, you know, these are big events that change the slope of how well that person might overall do. What I like about this particular slide and why I like to put it in here is, that it's also important to notice that there's always yellow across the disease trajectory. And this really gets to the point about primary palliative care and whether we're, we're primary care clinicians, whether we're oncologists or, or, or cancer-focused providers, that palliative care isn't something that we just turn on when the person has end-of-life situations. If we're thinking about palliative care and that large green sphere outside of hospice and outside of comfort care, we have to think about each of our responsibility to provide excellent and meticulous symptom management to our patients. And that's the real beauty of this particular course, this particular year, is that throughout the day tomorrow, you're gonna get tidbits, you're gonna get tools to think, how do you manage when the person's on the left side of this trajectory, when they have a new diagnosis, how are you going to better manage their pain? How are you going to better manage their dyspnea? How are you going to better manage their nausea or their derm complications or their mood issues? Because really it's all, all of our responsibility. And as a palliative care provider, I simply can't see every patient who has every malignancy. Yes, we know that in, in the, the Temel study, we know that there's a benefit to palliative care in, in patients with advanced lung cancer. But we also know that there's patients with pancreatic cancer and colon cancer. And, and hematologic malignancies. And that doesn't even touch upon heart devices and dialysis patients. And you know, there's a lot of people who could benefit from palliative care services. And really, this particular conference is about helping us all to become more comfortable with our own skills and, and not waiting until things get really bad uh, to call palliative care. But how do we begin to manage each of these uh, issues in our own individual practice? So how do we help people to make decisions? Because quite honestly, we know that the Marcus Welby method of the 1960s where Marcus was always just and right and the patient always did exactly what Marcus told them, that's not gonna happen anymore. And we know that we're in situations where we can't have patients just come in and demand treatments 
that might potentially be harmful to them and that we can't ethically or morally be compelled to provide treatments that we know are going to be harmful to them, right? And this is hard because, you know, folks will say, yes, it's very easy for you to say if a person comes in with shallow ulcers in their mouth and they have, you know, no lymphadenopathy and they have a cough and they don't have a fever, we could look at the centaur criteria and say, I don't even need to send a strep swab off. The pretest probability is so low that this person has strep. This is a viral illness. I'm not going to send, send off a strep test, and I'm not going to put them on antibiotics. That's a very different example than when your person comes in with third line, uh, with, with recurrent lung cancer that's already on third line therapy. And we know that if they responded to first line therapy, there might be X percent, say 40 to 50 percent, then we're down to 30 to 40 percent. And now we're looking at clinical trial type numbers where we're looking at you know, less than 20 percent response rate. And we're looking at the potential harms of that treatment and saying this person has a, an ECOG score of, of 3 plus, uh, or this person has a Karnofsky score of 30. This is not the person that should be getting chemotherapy. And even though this person is saying, I need to live, and you need to do everything you can to help me to live, how do we as clinicians engage in this situation and become comfortable with saying, everything to help you to live the best you can, as long as you can, may mean that chemotherapy is not what we do. And that's really hard to change our frame of reference to say, why are you not doing something to fight the cancer, when really we know that doing something that's cytotoxic or has potential side effects uh, in, in this frail uh, patient with recurrent disease may actually be more harmful. How do we engage in, you know, we look at, uh, at you know, this RPA guideline for initiation and withdrawal of dialysis, you know, it really, really is, is a nice guide, but still, you know, you talk to nephrologists and they say, you know, I start at dialysis, I follow this patient for a long time, how do I engage them in the discussion that maybe dialysis isn't helping them anymore, that they're not getting up out of bed in between dialysis days anymore, that they're having persistent hypotension, and I'm not able to pull as much fluid as I could before, and that we really need to talk about, is this achieving what our goals of care are? And in heart failure, we could think about that, because now it's not just a matter of the drugs, it's a matter of nifty things like left ventricular assist devices, not just for patients who get transplants, but for patients who are going to get those as their final heart treatment. They will live with that device for the end of their life. And they hope that the, the survival, uh, they hope and know that the survival with that treatment tends to be better for patients with advanced heart failure, but they also know that it may be a struggle in terms of survival does not always equal quality of life. And that's something that's really hard. But when we have technology, when we have things like left ventricular assist devices, when we have pacemakers and defibrillators. And I know I have to walk out of the room, uh, so I didn't put any particular medications in there. When we have the newest, shiniest drug that's out there that may potentially have a X percent response rate in patients, do we feel compelled to do it even though it may be harmful to patients? This is where, you know, I'm very interested in oncology, and I, again, want patients, uh, you know, patient with pancreatic cancer, a good functional status, I absolutely want them to get their gemcitabine, and if they could tolerate that now, paclitaxel, go for it, like, absolutely. But we have to think about some of the more advanced therapies and the smaller response rates and, and the real potential of burdens and very, very complex side effects and potentially real challenges with how are they gonna pay for these medications if insurance doesn't cover them, how are they going to receive these treatments if they're in rural Alabama and they have to go to Birmingham or they have to come to, to Mobile or they have to go to Atlanta or they have to go to New Orleans or they have to go to, to MD Anderson to be able to receive this treatment and do they really have the funds to, to even do that? And it doesn't become am I a candidate for the, the clinical trial, it becomes will this clinical trial help me to achieve what's important to me? And sometimes that's hard because we think about what's important to me is to be cured. What's important to me is, is to live as long as I can, and that's a challenge. 
So when we think about goals of care and what patients' goals of care are, I like this particular situation because, first of all, it puts the patient at the center, right? If our aims are beneficent, we want to do good, and that's at the center of what our, our aims are, the patient and outcomes that are relative to that patient become the central aim of what we, we try to help make decisions with. And when we think about the upper right-hand corner, we think about survival, and this is where, in the oncology world, in the uh, uh, cardiology world, people are much more comfortable with those statements. If we treat you with chemotherapy X and Y, the likelihood of response is X percent where if we did treatment Z, we know the likelihood of response is Y percent. Or we know that the adjusted overall survival median is nine months for patients who got regimen A versus seven months for regimen B. And the patient looks and says, I don't know what adjusted overall survival means, but nine is bigger than seven, so I want to do that. Because we're comfortable talking about survival and knowing the studies. But what about quality of life? What about symptoms? What about functional status? What about mental and emotional and, and, and social aspects? And how important are they to the patient? You know, what about that patient who says, survival's not the most important to me. I'm okay with God. I'm okay with where I'm at. I want to have good quality of life with my family. And how do we put that up against costs and burdens? And, you know, for the left ventricular assist device, I can tell you I, I've talked to patients and they say, I want this, Medicare covers it. And they're absolutely right. Medicare covers the index hospitalization, which is, you know, on average $144,000 to get the device and all the aftercare associated with that. But that doesn't mean that Medicare pays for them to come from Bismarck, North Dakota, down to Rochester 10 hours away and stay at a bed and breakfast hotel for 35 days while their loved one's in the ICU. Or when their loved one gets out and is coming home and needs to have sterile dressings, and the, the, the caretaker has scleroderma and can't do that. So it's up to the patient to do that themselves, and that puts them at risk of infection. So the costs of getting the extra care to, to be able to prevent that infection or the cost of not being able to work and having burned through all of the FMLA when dad was on inotropes and, and or when dad was on his first stem cell transplant and now he's relapsed and we're talking about a second stem cell transplant and I don't have any FMLA back. It doesn't really matter what Medicare pays if they pay for that second transplant or not or if private insurance pays for that second transplant. So we have these factors and, and Larry Allen is, is a, a good friend and, and and I get to tease them because I say, this is potentially the most beautiful slide I've seen in a paper in a long time. But I have never met a patient where all three circles are equal. I have never met a patient where they said nine months versus seven months is just as important to me as being free from pain and toxicity, is just as important to me as being away from my family and not financially bankrupting the people uh, that I worked so hard to try to support and now are dealing with the complications of my disease at this point. They're the people that say, life is sacred at all costs. Do everything you can within your power to help me to live the best I can as long as I can. I don't care if I am in a bed in a skilled facility with a peg tube because life is sacred at all costs. It doesn't matter what it does to my family. And then you have the patients that say, again, survival, not the biggest deal. How well am I going to feel? How is my family going to remember me? How am I going to have this particular situation to, to spend quality time? And, you know, and I, I live with this in, in a very true example where my dad, unfortunately, passed away about five years ago of a papillary renal tumor. And he had a, you know, initial presentation and had um, uh, surgical partial nephrectomy and, and did great and negative margins and then it recurred. So he did sunitinib and he was sick. He was really sick. And he had mouth sores and mucositis and my mom said, you don't have to do this for us. Like, you don't have to do this. But his oncologist worked through it, reduced his dose, and he had a mixed response. So they said, well, we're going to switch off this anyway. So then it was Everlimus. So then it was Everlimus, and he had done okay on that. 
but really was getting sicker and sicker and sicker and had marked pulmonary progression and, and pleural disease. And when it comes down to it, when we think about this, what were the, the, the outcome factors that were relevant? When I flew home from Minnesota to talk to my dad about those factors, for him it was very clear. For his oncologist it was very clear. I will see you back in clinic in a week and we'll talk about pozopinib. You should tolerate that very well. And for him it was, my son's explained to me that my performance status is 50% and that I have really bad floral based disease and I'm really short of breath and I would like to go home and spend time with my family and my grandchildren have flown in from Minnesota and they would like to be home with me and not remember Paca as dying in an ICU but they would like to have memories of him at home. So that translated to coming home and my children know what dad does with hospice care. You're helping a family just like Paca needed help. And they have pictures of him painting their nails at home. They don't have pictures of him having an endotracheal tube removed because for him, survival wasn't the most important thing. It was an unfixable, uncurable, terrible situation. And to take treatment that might have shortened that already short survival and had unbearable toxicity or cost of, of causing my mother to, to provide you know, care when he was getting progressively sicker it was a very easy question. But that's a hard thing to do to sit down with a patient. Sometimes it's really hard, particularly when you have a relationship with them. And we know that the numbers sometimes can get in the way of that discussion. So how do we help to really sort out, and I'll draw this sometimes for patients, and they'll say, you know, if, uh, say if you have, you know, 10 jelly beans and you have these three bins, where do you want to put your jelly beans? You know, if you have 10 quarters and three piggy banks, which piggy bank do you want to put them in? And often folks will tell me, you know, I want this and this, I'm not worried about that. Or I want this and living longer isn't necessarily the goal if it's going to cause side effects, if it's going to cause toxicity. So how we engage people in goals of care discussion sometimes is, is really a challenge between going beyond an understanding of code status. So when I see house staff coming in and they say this person just wants to be resuscitated and they want to go to the ICU and, and you could talk to them because I don't know what they want. They have stage 4 pancreatic cancer and, and this doesn't make sense. There are two separate issues. There's the issue with resuscitation and there's the issue of what your goals are. And goals of care are not achieved through cardiopulmonary resuscitation unless that particular goal of care is absolute survival at all costs. So when I hear people talking about the code status, I try to say to patients, if your heart stops or you stop breathing, you know, do you want us to call an emergency and use machines to try to bring you back to life, knowing that you have this particular underlying condition? And then before they do, I kind of do the dot, dot, dot. But no, regardless of what you choose, if you want to have your heart attempted to be restarted or not, and if I need to go in and say patients with advanced metastatic cancer have a less than 12% survival, uh, even with a witness cardiac arrest, or patients with frailty and on dialysis have less than 10% likelihood of neurologically intact survival, which they don't want to hear. But what they do want to hear is, it's okay that you're very sick and that I might not recommend us calling an emergency to restart your heart if your heart stops. But know that short of that, I will do everything I can to help you to live the best you can as long as you can. That may mean a feeding tube if it's, if it's a mechanical fixed obstruction or if it's a person early with ALS. That may mean BiPAP in a given situation if they have the means of tolerating. That may mean doing dialysis if it's helping them to achieve their goals of care. It may mean doing a trach or giving blood or doing pressors or doing antibiotics or doing chemotherapy. It may mean any of those things. But all of those things, it's really how are these treatments going to help you to achieve what's important to you? And all of those things don't need us to basically try to do things to help you to stay here if you've already died. And, and I will use that to make a recommendation and say, in your particular situation, I want you to know that 
it's not my recommendation that we do CPR. However, know that I will do everything I can to get you to that wedding, to get you to better pain control, to get you to be at home. But it's not my recommendation that we do CPR. What I can tell you anecdotally is 80%, 85, 90% will say I agree with you. That's exactly what I wanted. And that's how we end up in the ICU because I'm willing to go to the ICU to treat something that is readily reversible, i.e. urosepsis. But if I was in DIC with a perfed viscous for my metastatic gas gastric cancer, I would not be making that same recommendation to the patient. And that particular patient went and got aggressive fluids for early parenteral goal-directed therapy, uh, was out of the ICU within 36 hours, went home, and had a month on hospice. And that helped him to achieve that goal of home. It didn't get him to Aruba, where the family was planning a big trip the week after. And I said, again, your goals of care may be Aruba, but I'm not sure we could deliver on that. So when we establish goals of care, what do patients hear about cure versus, versus a response? What do they hear about that 35% response rate versus 35% cure? And how do we as clinicians help to, to really make sure that they heard that? And there's great work uh, of, of patients that had metastatic lung cancer that were getting palliative radiation therapy and thought they were going to be cured from it. And, and I don't blame clinicians for that. They probably did a very good job. And we know that patients, they hear a diagnosis and they, they struggle to, to try to process all that. But we know that you know, sometimes it gets mixed in the picture. Why are we doing the treatment? Am I doing this because I think it's going to go away? What I'm willing to do if I'm found to have AML right now and I could be cured of that AML may be very, very different than what I'm willing to do if I'm 75 and have high-risk AML and know that I'm never going to get to, to an allo transplant. Different situation. What are the treatments that are available and what are the associated risks and benefits? Again, using AML as the example. If we do that, if we can't cure your AML, what uh, is available that's palliative? Is 7 plus 3 palliative in this particular situation? Or is palliative hydroxyurea and symptom management something that might be appropriate and transfusion support? Might one be associated with a higher risk of inpatient mortality versus the other allowing patients to potentially move to an outpatient setting and continue to do those things? How do they understand what the treatments that are available if cure is not, not uh, possible and how is it going to help them? If I do that treatment, how is it going to impact quality of life? Or if I don't do that treatment, how is it going to impact quality of life? So we know that when we look at the old data for left ventricular assist devices, now people, about 70% of patients who get a left ventricular assist device as destination therapy, meaning they will never be transplanted, 70% of those patients are alive at two years. When you look at very, very old data on inotropes or other palliative therapy, uh, what, what they would call optimal medical management for advanced heart failure, maybe 10% are alive at two years. So, you know, that's one thing to say 70% versus 10% at two years, I'm going to go for the 70%. But what does it mean to have a device in you that you will be dependent on batteries, that you will not be able to get in the water again, uh, that you will need to have a caretaker, uh, that you're at a 10% risk of stroke in the first year, 15% by the second year, and, and how might your life be if you had a stroke and were incapacitated from a stroke, but your heart was doing great with this really awesome device that has a 70% two-year mortality rate? So it's not just about those whopping differences on Kaplan-Meier curves, because as I said sometimes, and it sounds kind of silly, but I think it's true, Kaplan-Meier curve shows survival. They don't tell us anything about quality of life. They don't tell us anything about whether the treatment made the person feel better. They don't tell us about whether the treatment made the person achieve what was important to them. And that's really, really where we as clinicians need to be aware of that. Because for us, Pellegrino, in that virtue ethic uh, of, of beneficent being central, it comes down to thinking about what is the efficacy of the treatment, what are the benefits of the treatment, and what are the burdens of the treatment. 
And what he would argue and what I would agree with is that we're the arbiters of the efficacy of the treatment. We can tell them how effective it is to start hemodialysis on a patient with hepatorenal syndrome in the ICU. It's not good, and I hope that whoever's on for nephrology that week agrees with me that we're not even going to offer dialysis because it's a bad idea. But that might be the situation. It's just not efficacious. But in terms of saying, I'm not sure this person should do fourth-line chemotherapy. Um, you know, we know that there's some potential. It's, it's breast cancer. Uh, Tom Smith always taught me during fellowship, you know, never give up because sometimes there's people will have really bad disease and they'll respond to just switching over to something fourth line. Breast cancer is different, Keith. I never knew that going in. That was really important for me to learn as a palliative care. And even though it might be marginally effective for some people, the benefits and the burdens might not be that bad. And it might be worth trying single agent navalbine or single agent fulvestrant after the several other treatments that they've already had. And that really, really was important to me to think, you know, Sometimes the burdens of ongoing chemotherapy aren't bad. We use the dramatic examples for the advanced lung and, and third-line therapy or the advanced pancreatic and third-line therapy. But sometimes treatments, third-line lymphoma treatment can be very, very uh, efficacious. Uh, not great, but efficacious enough that the person's willing to accept the benefits and burdens. And it's not really for us to say, what do we think is too burdensome? What do we think is too beneficial? It's really what the patient is really willing to go through. It's not what their family thinks they're willing to go through, and that's what I hear a lot. Dad, he's going to take this treatment because uh, I'm not really concerned about what you think Dad should do. I'm really concerned what Dad thinks he should do and whether Dad thinks this is going to be helpful. So I think, you know, hopefully I've given you some things to think about to frame why this conference is really important because we're going to try to give people the tools to, to help manage symptoms, but hopefully we, we start off with, with a broader construct of palliative and supportive care, and we think about a broader construct of what our responsibility is as clinicians, that we have an obligation to work with our patients to make sure that they get open and honest communication, and we know that there's plenty of work done by Holly Pregerson and the Dana-Farber group that shows that open, honest communication with patients is not associated with decreasing hope. So you can't use the, I don't want to take away their hope discussion anymore because the evidence actually shows that patients maintain hope and that there's actually much lower rates of, of caregiver uh, bereave, uh, abnormal bereavement and, and complicated grief if we can have these discussions in a meaningful situation. So it's okay to make a recommendation. Um, I don't tend to tell people to say, if it was my brother, I would do this. I'm really not concerned about what your brother has or what you would do for your brother. I'm concerned about what's most important to me and what would you recommend knowing what my goals, values, and preferences are in this situation. And understanding again that though patients may demand or request therapies uh, that potentially can be harmful, we're not obligated to respect autonomy at all costs. It's really about coming up with a comprehensive plan of care that helps the patient to meet their goals of care in that situation. Thank you.